Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us on this historic day for mankind. And we're glad that you're with us to stay curious today on that day. As you see behind me, this is why it is maybe the, one of the most historic days that will always be remembered as long as humanity is on the face of the earth. The day that we took a, a capsule, took something man-made and put it orbit into earth. And here you see an artist's rendition of Sputnik 1, launched October 4th, on 1957 by the, by the United Soviet Socialist uh, Republic. Uh, of course, we know them as Russia today, the largest continent on the face of the earth. And uh, today they're partners in space, somewhat adversaries on the ground, but they started it all. The space age began today. And uh, I want to say hi to Marty Winkle, my co-producer here. As we're, we're into our 900th episode here. We're, we're uh, clicking along here. Marty, you know, we've been to the Space Museum I have for six years. I always hear the old timers talk about this date in history. And, and uh, you hear it talked about often in your career with the lunar module and space shuttle, correct? No, really, I uh, heard very little about Sputnik back in, in the Apollo days. I heard about it when I was in high school. Right. Well, that's, I mean, uh, from the standpoint that everybody looks back, so many people said they saw it. But did you see it? Well, I've got a list of some, uh, a few Sputnik facts that uh, maybe you didn't see it. Maybe you saw something else. So uh, I was just talking to John Tribe today, one of the legends of the Apollo program. And John did a great program with us about hypergolic fuels and so forth. Uh, and he remembers seeing Sputnik. Yesterday was uh, astronaut um, uh, Charlie Duke's 88th birthday. And John Tribe reminded me, Marty, the story I want to remember about 88-year-old uh, Charlie Duke. Apollo 16 had a hypergolic leak in a bladder that was above the heat shield in the command module. They had to pull it back to the VAB, fix it, had to take the heat shield off, very elaborate thing. A lot of people got, you know, chewed out for it, except one, uh, what people didn't know was during that six week period of fixing Apollo 16 that was out on the pad from a hypergolic leak in the command module, six weeks later, it flew. During that six weeks period, about a week into the, the, the event, Charlie Duke got pneumonia and would not have been able to fly. And the backup would have been Edgar Mitchell, and that had been his second trip to walk on the moon. A little bit of space trivia there that this delay allowed Charlie Walker to be the 10th, uh, uh, Charlie Duke, yeah, Charlie Duke, to be the 10th person on the, on the moon. A lot of Charlies we know out there for sure. Uh, so um, a little bit of trivia there. We wanted to remind everybody that this is the weekend that we're having our charity memorabilia auction. You pay $100 for an item or you're going to pay $120 plus shipping because we had a 20% uh, charity fee to that to support our nonprofit. Astronaut Woody Spring has a lot of items in this collection, including some flown medallions called Robin's Medals that we're going to show you a little taste of the auction here, uh, you can pre-bid now, go directly to that pre-bid site and register your credit card by hitting that QR code or go to the American Space Museum website. You'll see auctions at the top. Bid Again Auctions is the auction house with uh, uh, that, that we use on there. And we're going to be talking about uh, the auction more on Friday, the day before, get a little more detailed into some of the items that we have on there and what the, the bids are. Tomorrow, I'm very excited to interview a uh, person I've looked up to in my newspaper career. Mr. Bill Harwood is a CBS News space reporter covering the Space Coast since about 1984. He, at his age, uh, sorry, Bill, but you're the Dean of Space Journalists and uh, wrote a beautiful book on astronomy uh, that we're going to share also. He's an amateur astronomer, has telescopes, so real kindred spirit, uh, had newspaper ink uh, flowing through his veins in his young days uh, growing up in uh, Tennessee, in the, the Nashville area. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking to Bill Harwood tomorrow at 4 o'clock live here at the American Space Museum's Stay Curious program. 
We are initiating a Galaxy of Giving campaign that we're going to start November 1st. So uh, if you're getting ready for those tax deductible donations, please keep us in mind. If you want to give right now, there's the QR code. But we've done this in the past. We created a constellation of your giving dollars and reveal that constellation star by star. And then when we fill in the constellation at the end of November, we'll show you what exactly it looks like in dot to dot fashion. So a good way to help uh, support the American Space Museum financially. You can also join us by becoming a member of the American Space Museum. This is our web uh, front page of our website. There's the beautiful Space View Park. Those pylons have astronaut or have space workers' names on them that worked on the shuttle era. Are you on one of those two pylons there, Marty, or three of them? Yeah, I'm on Apollo and space shuttle. Yep, he's on both of them, and there was a hundred dollars and and to support the building of this beautiful uh, facility there. Uh, as you see at the top, you see auction at the top. You see at the far right the yellow button is the donate button and you hit the donate button and there's what it looks like uh, to donate many ways to our museum you can become a member okay 25 dollars uh, individual 40 for family i believe that's what it is right now our board of directors is looking at those prices as as every organization in this inflationary times but we need your support to keep the american space museum preserving the birth of America's space age right here in this delivery room, Brevard County, Florida. So uh, we thank you all for considering us. And remember, we are a legal 401 uh, uh, C3 here in the state of Florida. So um, you can get a tax deductible certificate from us. Well, let's talk a little bit about Sputnik 1 and, and uh, what, a, what a, a moment in time this was. 66 years ago, uh, there are few moments in human history that will be noted for thousands of years, and today's one of them, the launch of the first object to orbit the Earth. Uh, October 4th, 1957, the Communist Nation of the United Union of, it's a Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, launched the first artificial satellite. Here you see it, you get an idea just how small it was, two feet in diameter, very shiny. You can see the technician's face in that. He's in all these pictures. You see this picture and this guy is in all of the pictures. Um, got a lab coat on and a, a hamburger hat on top of him there from White House. But what do you notice is odd about the picture, Marty, about the gentleman in it? He doesn't have gloves on. Why is he in a white? He's this is the world's first artificial satellite. I mean, put your gloves on, man. You could contaminate the the universe. Uh, of course, they might weren't thinking about that. Uh, well, the world has never ever been the same since. And uh, everybody that lived through that, that was probably six at least six years old, claims they went out in the backyard and saw it, or did they? Well, let's look at some facts about uh, Sputnik. Uh, as we look at it kind of taken apart. Um, Sputnik in Russian means fellow traveler. Now, don't forget the Nick part of this. Sputnik, okay, means fellow traveler. The spherical satellite was just under two feet wide and weighed 184 pounds. Why was that? Because it had a heavy battery in it. Battery is always the heaviest part. That silver zinc battery there in the middle, all right, was the heaviest part of this vehicle. Today, we know how batteries have gone. Marty, I still lug around a, a, a battery charger for my telescope that probably weighs about 16 pounds, about two gallons of milk, it seems like, to hold. Uh, and now you can buy the same thing and fit it in your pocket, put out just as much energy. So um, the radio transmitter, it had heat shield on it for the uh, going into space. Not exactly sure they weren't like re-entry heat shields. The uh, three zinc uh, battery, the uh, silver zinc batteries function for 22 days, broadcasting a beeping signal. Now, the Soviets were originally wanting to put up a um, larger satellite, a 3,000 pound payload, but it wasn't ready. 
and uh, they use uh, uh, they actually launched it on Sputnik 3, but they did an adaption of it for the second satellite ever, Sputnik 2, with the dog Laika in it on November 3rd, 1957. So that was really a shocker. First Sputnik goes up, very small, not weighs much. A month later, they put up something that weighed a couple tons, and it had a living creature in it, a dog. So uh, it was game on, and the U.S. Uh, space race with the Russians had begun. Um, well, the Vert Worlds, this Sputnik lasted in space just three months, entering the atmosphere and burning up on January 4th, 1958. By contrast, the United States' first satellite, Explorer 1, launched on February 1st, 1958, just uh, November, December, January, February, four months later, transmitted under battery power for four months, making scientific discoveries about the Van Allen belt, and it burned up in the atmosphere 12 years later in 1970. So, uh, well, this spawned a lot of interest in space, of course. 1958 was going to be the international geophysical year where the world was going to focus on science and kind of reset themselves. And they did to look at what progress had been made and see where countries can share technology. Uh, the international uh, geophysical year, IGY. And our president, Eisenhower, he was more looking to launch a satellite in 1958 to kind of highlight the year for the U.S. He underestimated, our president did, this military hero of World War II, how the public would perceive this small satellite as the as as interpreting that Russia was indeed the supreme power on the earth and most advanced technologically, which in some ways they were, in other ways they weren't. So. Uh, this was really a, 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 a moment uh, where, where uh, uh, like, you know, people were thinking about space. Here is a photograph somebody took. Uh, we had science fiction movies and so forth, but now it has become real. Something was orbiting the Earth. We could hear it beeping across our nation. This was the proliferation of the nuclear Cold War was going on, in fact, uh, in 1957. Uh, and here's a few star patterns, and you see the streak of the, uh, uh, was it Sputnik or was it not? Well, actually what this is is the R7 rocket booster, which also went into orbit with the satellite, and it fell back two months later. A lot of satellites, including America's Atlas rocket and the Centaur second stage, actually went up to space and orbited for a period of time with the satellites they deployed after they separated. Uh, this was an 85 foot rocket body, pretty big, and covered with reflective panels to make tracking it easy. So that is what people really saw. Sputnik was too small, though it was very polished, uh, aluminized uh, metal. This is what you saw was the booster on there. And it spawned a, a, an, an advent or a, a uh, interest in um, amateur astronomy. And there was also a satellite looking clubs that sprung up around the nation and the young men there at the table are looking through telescopes that are looking into a mirror marty a mirror is what's in front of them and they're looking in that mirror well that mirror is looking at the sky so you can like it's like me looking in a pond with binoculars and looking at the the moon as long as the moon's steady you know i see an image in there and the idea was you don't crane your necks looking up all the time Poe shot, of course, look at those guys like that, looking away. It was a male-dominated hobby at the time. Not so much so now, 60-some uh, years later. Uh, I'd say over half the amateur astronomers, uh, at least a good over a third are, are female in the clubs I participated in over the years. Well, uh, one other comment. Let's see about the, um, the think about this about Sputnik, Marty. Sputnik. It created a cultural impact in many ways, okay. Uh, uh, you had the song Telstar that was very popular a, um, by an English group that was an instrumental named after our Telstar satellite. Well, the cultural impact created a Nick craze from Sputnik that stuck with Beatniks, okay. Beatniks. 
of the 1959 is when the beatnik word got popularized uh, to 60 to 62. Then you had peace nicks in the late 60s, uh, protests in the Vietnam War, and you even have neat nicks, okay? So uh, I had never connected Sputnik with beatniks and peace nicks, Marty, but that was part of the culture back then, taking this satellite's name, which means uh, a fellow traveler uh, in uh, Russian. So, so that's our little look into some little known facts about Sputnik in uh, uh, October 4th, 1957 will forever be in the annuals of history alongside July 20th, 1969, the first landing on our moon. Well, we've got a couple birth one birthday today. Happy birthday today to this fella. We've got 64th birthday to, uh, actually 66, to a two-time shuttle astronaut Greg Linteris. He was a mission specialist on STS-83 in April 97 that was cut short by the fuel cell problem. Uh, and then they reflew it on STS-94. So he was, uh, there are several astronauts on this mission that this was their only mission, uh, kind of a one and done, but it was two flights of this science laboratory. Nonetheless, he's an astronaut, true blue. He, he went through all the training, uh, born in Inglewood, New Jersey, grew up in Demarest. Uh, so we had another, New, uh, Kathy Sullivan was born in New Jersey. Is that who we're talking about? Yeah, and, but she grew up in California. Uh, let's see, Greg Linteris was a mission specialist, like I said, on 83, that was repeated in 94, on STS-94. Uh, he's a medical, mechanical engineer at the Flammability Reduction Group of Fire Research Division. He is into fire, and uh, controlling it uh, is a thing that he learned in college at Princeton University. And we wish a 66th birthday to Greg Lintris, one of those little obscure astronauts out there that flew just one mission, but he flew it twice on that 83-94 reflight in uh, 1997. And we want to spend a little time talking about something that we omitted yesterday, October 3rd, 1962, is the launch of Mercury Atlas 8, which is, of course, Wally Schirra, one of the great Mercury astronauts, one of the most friendliest, fun, and loving of all of the Mercury astronauts. Uh, and that is my opinion from a lot of people that have met the man. Uh, did you ever meet Wally Schirra, Marty? I, I certainly never did, but we know our astronaut wrangler, Nick Thomas, has told us some good stories about him, and we're going to hear one today. Did you ever meet Wally, Marty? No, I wish I had, but no, I have not. Um, well, uh, this was a nine. This was a nine-hour flight. Okay, he was the third orbital flight um, in the Mercury program after, of course, John Glenn's three orbits, then repeated by Scott Carpenter's three orbits, uh, and then in, in uh, February, and Scott Carpenter's was in uh, July, I think. And then this was a nine-hour flight, six orbits, the longest to date. And it set up the day-long flight that um, uh, Gordon Cooper was going to do in 1963. A little, some of the little, let's, we'll get to, put, where's Wally's picture? There's Wally, learning how to use a couple cameras. He's got a Hasselblad laying there and a 35 millimeter in his hand. Uh, Nikon, I'm sure, that's Deke Slayton looking over that. And then two technicians there from NASA showing him there. And I'm going to bet Tom Usiak's going to tell me who the guy on the right is, because I forget his name. Uh, but Wally was awoken at 1.40 a.m. on October 3rd and had a hearty breakfast, including a bluefish that he speared the day before out there on the coast. He had a brief physical, went to the launch pad around 4 a.m., got in the spacecraft at 4.41, where he found a steak sandwich left for him in, quote, the glove compartment. And then he began his pre-launch checks. Um, it was launched at uh, uh, without delay about 6:45 in the morning. Uh, this was uh, later, uh, so he got up into orbit 
in just three and a half minutes into the flight, Deke Slayton, shown here in this picture, the capsule communicator and chief astronaut, not sure he'd been grounded yet for a heart murmur, he cut in to ask Wally, quote, are you a turtle today, unquote. Well, what does that mean? Are you a turtle today? What does that mean? Well, we're going to tell you about that here in just a second. Uh, Shara, unfazed, announced that he was switching to the onboard voice recorder rather than broadcasting the radio circuit to the world, and he left his answer on that tape recorder, which was, you bet your sweet ass I am. A turtle, so to speak. Well, here's the here's the joke. The Turtle Club, and we have this on the wall here at the American Space Museum in our Mercury Gemini Gallery, thanks to the work of Nick Enix, our collections manager here. The International Association of the Turtle is a well-known group to astronauts, pilots, and anyone who takes risks, risks in their lives. Started by World War II uh, aviators, the Turtles gained international fame in the space program. Uh, membership in the club was highly valued and, it, and required adherence to the Turtle Creed. The Turtle Creed is, Turtles are bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, fearless, and unafraid folk with a fighter pilot attitude. They think clean, have a lot of fun, and recognize that you never get any place worthwhile in life unless you stick your neck out. <laughs> That's the turtle part of it, Marty. Sticking your neck out. Well, if someone said, are you a turtle? You had to answer with the phrase, you bet your sweet ass I am. And yes, you had to say the word for but. <laughs> or you would be required to buy a beer for everyone within earshot. At a time when off-color language was never heard on television or in the media, and certainly not from the lips of national heroes, the astronauts delighting in asking each other the question in the most uncomfortable of possible public circumstances. Thus, Deke Slayton, are you a turtle today, Wally? And he said, you bet your sweet ass I am. Marty, a question there. So I got a comment from uh, Tom Usiak. <laughs> Excuse me. Not who or shoot the guy on the right is, but Wally took the first Hasselblad to space. Oh, great. Thank you. And, uh, as a former Hasselblad owner like to, like to Tommy there, uh, there's your Hasselblad camera laying there. It is a, uh, a 35 millimeters, 35 millimeters across. This is 120 millimeters across, almost four times the width, and you got about eight times the surface area there to record beautiful pictures there. And Wally took a few up there, but uh, I just love looking at our old... Mercury guys, Marty, I had their pictures on my wall, like many of you did up there and uh, as a young uh, boy uh, growing up. And uh, these were certainly my heroes, and not any of them are alive. Of course, John Young, the last one to pass away about four years ago uh, at age uh, 99. Uh, Wally died about 10 years ago, I believe. He lived into his 80s, and he did a lot. Uh, Sigma, Here is the Sigma-7 spacecraft, and... Uh, some of you don't be setting your hair on fire here because you, you see it on a redstone rocket. This is at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex, and they clearly say that this is Wally Shiraz Sigma 7 on the last redstone rocket that was uh, going to be for um, Deke Slayton, wasn't it? I think it's wrote inside there. Or no, maybe this was the one they were going to use for the second flight of Shepard. Uh, so, but uh, it is a little bit of a, a weirdness of history there, but that is the actual vehicle. Um, Wally did a very by the book space flight because um, uh, this predecessor there, Scott Carpenter, did not. Though Scott Carpenter did everything in his checklist and book, he did a little bit of sightseeing scientific-wise and maneuvered to see some features on Earth that maybe he didn't have permission to do. And Chris Kraft, the flight director, didn't like that, and he swore Shara would never fly, or Carpenter would never fly again, and he didn't. Uh, so while he was going to go by the book and be the team player, and, uh, of course, he ended up being a Gemini flight. Let's look at another picture of that. This is a familiar place to some of you. In fact, I saw the. this is one of the other places that this was before Kenny Space Center. This is the Astronaut Hall of Fame that was on 
415 going into the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, that was a couple of things. And now, uh, uh, who's who's in there now? They're using it. Not Rockwell. Rockwell's on the other side. But anyway, it's there in front of the hotels that are there uh, near the Space Center. But it looks beautiful in there. And uh, so uh, he did, uh, did a lot of Earth observations. Okay, he did look around some of the Earth. But this is interesting. Um, Wally said that he was unimpressed with the view of Earth from space. The amount of detail he could make out compared well with that of high-flying aircraft. And he told debriefers that it was, quote, nothing new that he saw on the ground compared to a flight at 50,000 feet about 10 miles. Overall, he concluded that Sigma-7 was the top of the list of aircraft he'd ever flown. Well, I hope so, displacing the F-8F Bearcat, a Navy piston engine fighter. Uh, the mission was described as textbook. And here's kind of the clincher of it as we look at a picture of Wally here, talk a little bit about him. His mission here in October 3rd, 1962, was in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where President Kennedy was in a showdown with Nikita Khrushchev, Premier of Russia, over nuclear weapons in Cuba. Now, little did the public know, we had nuclear weapons in Turkey, and we had a 100-year-old W.O. Brown tell us that. Remember that, Marty? Because he went over there to take the guidance systems out of them. Well, when Kennedy, when uh, Sherrall visited Washington, D.C. after his flight to receive the NASA Distinguished Service Medal from President Kennedy, on October 16th, that was the same day Kennedy had first seen U-2 spy photographs of missile sites in Cuba. Um, Robert Kennedy, of course, the Attorney General and President's brother, uh, Wally Sherrall later said that he was approached by Robert Kennedy and took him aside and was sounding him out for a political career, just like he did John Glenn. So apparently this is insinuating, and I think this is written in Wally's excellent book, Shiraz Space. I've read it a couple times. I love that book. I don't remember everything about every book I've read, okay? Many of them I've read 30, 40 years ago. But this is really a good book to revisit, Shiraz Space. But he was being uh, uh, looked uh, at for politics, and apparently this uh, Robert Kennedy had uh, um, laid this on John Glenn, and John Glenn kind of, where Sharab turned down the request to become a politician, Glenn uh, uh, looked into it and, of course, spent 25 years as an Ohio senator. Um, Wally went on to be the Gemini 6A commander. He flew the first rendezvous of two spacecraft in this sleek mission. Uh, then uh, he was the Apollo commander for Apollo 7, the 10-day return, or actually flight, of the rebuilt Apollo command module after the fire. The only astronaut to fly in a Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo spacecraft. And he spent the later years of his, of the, of his Apollo, uh, he retired from the, the Kennedy Space Center in 1969, um, and then become a correspondent. For CBS News there with Walter Cronkite, and that's what I watched. I watched Walter Cronkite and Wally Schirra, and I remember him wiping a tear away when Walter Cronkite was, was also a little bit verklept there at, when they landed on the moon that Sunday afternoon in, uh, on the East Coast time here. So uh, comment, Marty. We've got a comment from Tom Usiak again. If Shepard got his second flight, it would have been orbital orbital on an atlas yeah freedom 72 is that you bar hazy was the what freedom 72 was going yeah it yeah. wouldn't have been on that red zone have been on the atlas uh, right but it's also he's saying also it's at the uh Udvar Har hazy oh okay all right all right great yeah all right yeah it is i have seen that there yeah. with you tom i remember that right next to discovery uh thank you for that yeah didn't want to when I was talking there, I said I should say that the uh, Shepard was going to go on an Atlas rocket. The Redstone didn't have enough to put uh, astronauts in orbit, uh, get them up to 17,500 miles an hour. So, um, but it's still a beautiful thing to see up there in the uh, Hall of Fame uh, sponsored by Boeing, the Kennedy Visitors Complex there. So, loved everything about Wally Schirra. Uh One of the things uh, you'll hear about him is his gotchas. Him and 
uh, Alan Shepard were constantly playing practical jokes on themselves and everybody else, and the astronauts called them gotcha, you know, on there. And there's some real, a couple real good ones in Shiraz Space, an excellent book that you should revisit. And here's an ending talking about the great man. Is there he is uh, sitting in the Endeavor hatch up at the White Room, apparently, uh, with, of course, Jim Lovell, who's 93 years old. God bless you, Jim Lovell. Uh, I think Wally made it to about 88, something like that. He was a few years older being a Mercury astronaut there. But uh, uh, what a great picture that is of two uh, heroes of all of us space geeks out there and just great Americans. Well, thank you all for letting us look back at that a day late of the important mission of Mercury. Uh, uh, like I said, you can't underestimate how uh, the nation felt about this and was mesmerized by it. But while I was saying about the Cuban Missile Crisis, unfortunately, people didn't hear a lot, Marty, about this mission because the the uh, failed invasion happened the next, uh, you know, over over the and people just didn't. Uh, get into it that much. And then, of course, Gordon Cooper, early the next year, his day-long mission took a lot of center stage. Well, we're going to look here at our auction that's coming up there. Again, there's there's a easy way to get to the auctions. Go to our website or hit that QR code, and it'll take you right to it. Here's how it works. Right now, you can bid on the 300 and I think there's 60 lots up there. All right, 300. You can bid right now on an item, and we'll talk about that by looking at a couple items. There, Marty Winkle's got item 201 in there. That's a piece of Marty's. Uh, tell us what that is, Marty. It's Capcom foil uh, from Lem 12, Apollo 17. We had to remove the IMU prior to flight, and that was excess mylar that we had to cut away. It's actually mylar, it's not Capcom. But the, uh, a lot of people call it Capton, so we call it Capton in the write-up. Yeah, the Capton's actually darker, isn't it? Or, uh, it and the Inconel's a thicker. whole other thing. Yeah, it's darker, it's thicker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ben, he, there's a COA there. That should go for three, $400, really. And the starting bid's 50 okay? Uh, this is uh, from a week ago, so I don't have updated the prices uh, that are being bid on. But let's say I'm going to go, I want to own that, and I'm going up to $250 That's all I'll pay. Well, when Saturday starts at noon, and this will come up, 200, lot 200, that's about 200 minutes, so that's about three hours into the auction because there's about one lot a minute. So if you want to get just the Apollo stuff, tune in about an hour and a half in, in and you'll start catching the Apollo stuff. Um, but it starts at noon. You could, I put 250, that's how much I'm willing to go. And if the bidding starts on this and, and uh, someone bids 125 and then 150 and 175, and then, and then my bid goes to uh, uh, 200, all right, and nobody bids above that 200, though I'm willing to go 225, 250, two more levels. I get it for 200 bucks. Now there's going to be a 20% charity fee, so I'll pay $240. Thank you for supporting the American Space Museum with that charity fee. So there you see you got Harrison Schmidt signed lithograph and cover. He's the 12th man to walk on the moon. We just celebrated, like I said, uh, uh, Charlie Duke's birthday. He's 88. Harrison Schmidt's also 88. They are the two youngest men of the 12 that locked on the moon alive, all right? Harrison Schmidt's not going to be autographing stuff much longer. Uh, David Scott's 91, and, and Buzz Aldrin's 93, all right? Here we've got some Apollo uh, uh, coin sets there that are nice to have. And then really interesting on the right-hand side are these McDonnell Douglas mini profile books that have some artwork on the front like the wizard of id and things like that uh, a couple other artwork uh, pieces on there and uh inside is data of that mission that's kind of cool you know uh all, everything from dimensions of the spacecraft to the timeline proposed for the mission on there so uh, and that lot should go for there's uh, one there's five there's ten in there a pack of ten those are worth easy twenty bucks a piece all right in my mind and I've been taught by Chuck Jeffrey our auctioneer and 
and uh, uh, chief operating officer here at the American Space Museum. And uh, I'm proud of what I know. Uh, it's, it's amazing about some of this stuff. Well, let's look at another set of lots there. Again, featuring Marty's got a few items in there. You have some space memorabilia. Chuck will be happy to give you a free appraisal. Uh, if, if you're out of the area, you can email things to us. Again, go to the website of auctions and you can get in touch with directly with Chuck. There's a real rare aluminized fireman's park uh, hood. Firemen were very important on the Space Center. All right. Uh, uh, and there's a, a turncoat out there with the COA. A uh, meatball uh, of the uh, NASA logo on a beta cloth. Beta cloth is fireproof. All right. That's probably about four by four inches. Uh, the meatball about uh, two and a half maybe. Uh, that's worth $100 all day long. All right. Bidding starts at 50 uh, maybe you can snag it at a good price. Marty, you've got a Grumman 50th anniversary reunion. The end of your uh, your Grummy is getting together. It was kind of a sad end. I'm so privileged that I was part of that the last five years as your friend. Uh, tell us a little about that. Yeah, that's a shirt that we made available to the attendees. Uh, it's, hi, it's a good quality shirt. It's also a, a hat. And we have a painted metal and a silver medal. And that Grumman logo on, on the sleeve there is, is in my opinion, the most attractive of all. Of course, I love blue and gold. That was my high school colors of the Finley Trojans. Uh, and you've got a patch on the front there, an emblem that Marty did help design. And uh, this was your Grumman group getting together for the last time. It was quite an event there. So you can see that. I think you have a black version of that also on that, Marty. We've got a blue version. That was the black version. Oh, that okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I couldn't tell if it was deep blue. So we've got astronaut Woody Spring, uh, who was involved in the in the, 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 the what I want to say the beginning of the shuttle era, the first third of it when everything was new. He was one of the first spacewalkers. He did a lot of pioneering things to figure out how uh, we could maybe build something in space. Uh, basically played with Tinker Toys kind of in the, the, the payload bay to build a, uh, a framework thing. Well, this is some of his personal items. He's got an STS-1 launch there, uh, a flag that was flown on the Columbia, the second flight. He was on, um, I forget what he was on, 41. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll look that up here in a minute on my shuttle scroll. Uh, so the Robbins medals here. Robbins medals are offered to astronauts and they are flown uh, in space. Uh, they buy them. Uh, some of them are precious metals, silver or gold. Uh, and Woody Spring, I'm here. What is Woody Spring's flight? I don't remember, Marty, off the top of my head. I'm looking at these, these numbers here. Uh, he wasn't in the letter ones. Woody there no, that's Walker. Uh, uh, didn't jump out at me, so apologize for that. I'll have it for Friday's show. These medallions are about three inches across, or two and a half inches across, standard medallion size, uh, and they are the most sought-after medallions that have been flown. Here's a couple more from STS-51D. Was that his mission? No, that was Charlie Walker's mission. Um, that's going to bug me, and I'm apologizing to Woody. I can't remember that. Great guy. 51B, there's a flown gold Robbins medal. Look at that. Bidding starts at six grand. All right. They're not going to let it go for $2,500. That's, that's the least. And there you have a silver one there. So uh, very beautiful. Of course, in the auction are a dozen or more crew autographs of the entire crew of the shuttle. That's a collection uh, fetish of some people where they want to uh, be obsessed with getting all 135 space shuttles and there's a couple couple that didn't fly that actually had photos and everything done that we're going to talk about like 61 g i believe uh was one that didn't fly and uh, uh finally here we've got a uh uh another, there's the blue shirt marty was talking about a meatball cloth backpack patch a real big meatball patch okay like about eight inches across. Got some lunar and Martian soil simulants that have done out of uh, uh, colleges to simulate this so they can do things. And then again, astronaut autographs 
from the Apollo era, Mercury, Gemini. There's always Gordon Cooper uh, autographs in there as we help a vendor that uh, had Cooper sign a, a lot of things. So uh, start your collection. Start a little collection of your space memorabilia. Maybe focus on just the Mercury. Mercury stuff can go pretty affordable now. Uh, uh, and you can maybe, you know, some of these autographs, you might get lucky and only get us Wally Sharoff for 60 bucks. I'm going to be looking for those deals this Saturday, okay? Because uh, as long as it goes above the reserve that is established ahead of time. So go to the American Space Museum website, auctions, or click that QR code and start putting your bids in today and start a space memorabilia collection or find that cool item for your space cave and show it off to your friends when they come over uh, to look at uh, uh, the stars with you or football or whatever you're doing this fall and winter. And of course, these auctions help our American Space Museum. Well, thank you, Marty, for a great show. Just want to show Bill Harwood's face up there again. I'm excited to uh, talk to this uh, uh, brethren of the news business uh, like I was in, but I didn't spend my whole career in there. And uh, uh, we're going to talk to to Bill about some of the astronomy missions, some of his favorite space flights, just whatever he wants to talk about. So hope that you're with us here to share uh, story, hear stories from Bill Harwood, CBS News space reporter, and truly the dean of space journalists now that are covering everything here on the Space Coast. So thank you, Marty, for a great job today. Everybody, October 4th, Rocktober 4th, a date that will always live in history when this satellite sailed off the Earth and orbited our wonderful blue planet. So Marty, thank you for everything here. Thank you to our executive director, Karen Conklin, uh, and a special happy birthday to Angie Roberts, who is our grant writer and assistant here. Hope she has a good uh, with Bill Harwood. I'm Mark Marquez saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.